So James White is a Calvinist, and we're going to listen to what he thinks about Roman Catholics and our opinion of the perpetual virginity of Mary. Now, he takes the Protestant view, and I know what the Protestant view is because I held it for many years. I was a Protestant, a Baptist, between 2011 and 2022 when I returned and reverted to my original faith in Catholicism. And I did come back to Catholicism partially because I discovered that the Catholic beliefs about Mother Mary are true. And I discovered that because I started doing research. So today I'm going to present some of that research. I'm also going to talk about other dogmas like the Immaculate Conception. I'm going to bring in a little bit of what James White has to say, also what Mike Winger has to say. I'm also even going to talk about some of the Marian apparitions, including a very important one where Mary sort of voiced her opinion about what the Calvinists were doing. Calvinists like to destroy a lot of the images of her and her son. And at Our Lady of Saluva, we see what her response was. So we'll talk about that as well. I'm also going to present quotes from Martin Luther about the perpetual virginity of Mary. Quick hint, he supported it. And a quote from John Calvin on what he thought about the perpetual virginity of marriage. Mary. A quick hint, I've got this quote seems to indicate that he was not in favor of it. These beliefs, these Protestant beliefs, go all the way back to ancients such as Helvidius, who wrote a book against the perpetual virginity of Mary. And St. Jerome wrote his book against Helvidius in favor of the perpetual virginity of Mary. So we're gonna talk about that. We're gonna talk about where Mary appears in the Bible, what Mary's role is in the Bible as a Theotokos, the mother of God. And so stay tuned, you come to the right place where truth matters at christian-apologist.com. Now this Radio by James. Let's listen to what he says about Catholics and about the perpetual virginity of Mary. Now, in a nutshell, what Protestants believe is that Jesus had brothers. And they believe he had brothers because uh, it was mentioned in the Bible a couple of times, which I'm going to show you, where there are brothers and sisters of Jesus. However, in the ancient world, they often use the word brothers to also mean cousins, could also mean other relatives. So there could be other sorts of relationships, and that's what the Catholics believe. Some Catholics believe that Joseph had an earlier wife. He was a widower, and he had uh, he had kids from that particular wife. Others, like me, don't believe that. I believe that Joseph also was uh, not having sex when he was with Mary. I believe that he did not have a previous wife. I think that he came right into the marriage with Mary and he took care of her. She had a vow of perpetual virginity. And so I'm going to show you evidence right from the Bible that supports that. I'm also going to show you evidence. Uh, I'm also going to show you evidence from ancient church fathers like St. Jerome. So here we go. Now remember, if you're dealing with a Roman Catholic, this is not, well, we just think this is a better way of understanding. This is a dogma. You are anathematized if you do not believe this dogma. You are cut off from salvation if you reject this dogma. They're not saying that it's possible. Normally that's the argumentation as it's presented, but they're not saying it's possible that it might mean this, they're arguing it must mean something other than brother. Even though it's used with father and mother, and does does mother does Mary as his mother mean something different? So let's take a look at what the evidence is. So it's and we're gonna do that by going right to the Bible itself and some of the verses that point to Mary's perpetual virginity such as this in Luke 1, 26 to 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give you, give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who has called, 
who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Note, when Mary said, how will this be since I am a virgin? Mary had taken her perpetual vial of virginity because otherwise she would know how it will be. The same exact way it was with Abraham and Sarah and with Zechariah and Elizabeth. They consummated the marriage. They had sex. But that's not exactly what happened here. Mary's saying, how could it be? Because even though she's betrothed to Joseph, now uh, in, in the ancient Jewish world, being betrothed to somebody was even more serious and more of a commitment than even being engaged to get married. It was beyond engaged. So she was betrothed to Joseph. So she would have known as a young woman how it could be. But since she had taken this vow, she couldn't figure it out. This is what she responded with. This is an absolute beautiful verse. This is the most that Mary says at all in the entire Bible. Luke 1, 46 to 55. My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. Brent Petrie draws parallels between the Ark of the Covenant from Exodus with Mary as the Ark of the Covenant by noting that the Holy Spirit overshadowed the tabernacle, which contained the Ark of the Covenant um, in Exodus 40, 34 to 35, and also overshadowed Mary at the Annunciation in Luke 1, 35. After Jesus ascended, the Holy Spirit overshadowed believers. The Holy Spirit overshadows us today. David in 2 Samuel 6, 9, and 11 says, How can the ark of the Lord ever come to me? And in 11, And the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obededom, the Gittite, three months, and the Lord blessed Oded Obededom and all his household. Compare this with Elizabeth in Luke 1, 43. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Mary remained with Elizabeth for about three months before returning home. So you can see the ark of the covenant there. It's the word... Apesiaso, okay, so it means overshadow. In the Septuagint, we see the exact same word in those verses. And so that's pretty important stuff to consider. Now, let's also take a look at what Pastor Mike Winger has to say about the Ark of the Covenant. This particular video caught my attention. It's called Catholic Apologists Abuse Scripture to Teach Mariology How to Find Jesus in the OT Part 15. So Mike Winger has made a whole bunch of videos that are against Catholicism. He doesn't believe in Catholicism. He thinks that we are completely wrong. And here's what he has to say. But from that word overshadow, they say that relates to the to the tabernacle. By the way, the word that word is never used uh, related to the tabernacle in the Septuagint, in the Greek translation of the Old Testament. I look for it. I can't find it. Um, the word he was looking for, again, is episkiazo, and it is in there, and uh, it's also in 1 Kings 8, 10 to 11, and so we have the overshadowing occurring in the Old Testament, but let's listen some more. It's, it's other words that are used. Um, uh, I won't get into all the details there, but, but basically, this is fabricated. This is a fabricated connection. It's not established in the text. Um, but then the same article goes on to list four connections between the Ark and Mary to try to establish that she really is a picture. The Ark is a picture of Mary. So I'll give the four connections. And they're all from 2 Samuel 6 and Luke chapter 1. So Luke chapter 1, 2 Samuel 6, these two looked at together are supposed to give us the idea that Mary is this, um, uh, this Ark of the Covenant. So in 2 Samuel 6, 9, when the Ark is coming to David and he's receiving it after he's become king, he's very happy, right? He's very excited about the ark. And it says <clears throat> in chapter 6, verse 9 of 2 Samuel, And David was afraid of the Lord that day, and he said, How can the ark of the Lord come to me? Now parallel that to what happened when Elizabeth found out that Mary was coming to her in Luke chapter 1, verse 43. Elizabeth, as Mary's pregnant, Elizabeth says, And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? And it's the Let's take a note of something really important there. Mary, when she went to Elizabeth, the baby leapt in Elizabeth's wombs. The baby John, John the Baptist, leapt in Elizabeth's wombs. He leapt for joy because he heard the voice of Mary. We also have David who danced around 
So he was also dancing around in the presence of the ark. So it's a very similar relationship right there. And so we'll take another look at that. Uh, let's continue and see if, do we have anything else that might hint to the Ark of the Covenant in the Bible and its relationship to Mother Mary? Let's find out. We do. Hint ahead. Uh, but let's go back real quick and we'll talk about what the angel Gabriel first said. It said, uh, Kar kikaratomene. That's what he actually said. He said, hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Now the tense for kikaratomene could mean had been graced or is graced. And that would refer potentially to the Immaculate Conception of Mary, who was born without original sin. Mary uh, appeared in the Bible at the birth of Jesus, of course. And Mary treasured up all these things in Luke 2, 19, pondering them in her heart. She also was with Joseph when Jesus was 12. So Joseph was still alive when Jesus was 12. In Luke 2, 46 to 51, when we get the story about Jesus who had separated from them and he had been found in the temple preaching and sharing all kinds of important pieces of knowledge. She also was at the wedding at Cana in John 2, 1 to 5. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Good advice. <laughs> That's what his mother would say to all of us as children. Do whatever he tells you. Now, Mary was very obedient. And there's another part where she's mentioned in Matthew 12, 46 to 50. And this is the one where people would reference saying that Jesus has brothers. But again, it's like brethren, cousins, relatives. While he was still speaking to the people, behold, his mother and his brother stood outside asking to speak to him. But he replied to the man who told him, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand towards his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my mother, brother and sister and mother. At the foot of the cross. This is the clincher on why we believe Mary was a perpetual virgin, but also mainly that Mary did not have other sons or daughters. She didn't give birth to anybody else. She didn't consummate the marriage to Joseph. And this verse is this one of the strongest ones. At the foot of the cross in John 19, 24 to 27, it says, So the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Now note from a different gospel, we also find out that John, the apostle John's mother, was there too, John, the son of Zebedee. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his home. Now, the ancient church fathers have documented that this is absolutely the apostle John. Okay, so that is who this is. Who is the disciple who took Mary, took care of Mary in Ephesus, apparently. So if Jesus had brothers and sisters from Mary, they would have violated Jewish law to honor your mother and father. This kibud av viam is accomplished by actions that include feeding, dressing, and taking care of one's parents, just as servants would take care of their masters. In other words, Jesus would have had to give care of his mother over to his supposed brothers, James and Joseph, or the other two that were mentioned. But he didn't. Instead, he gave care of his mother over to the Apostle John. This is a very big, significant point. So please, if you're a Protestant listening, please notice this. So what else do we have? Now, these were my arguments. In fact, I found this slide deck from a video that I made private two years ago that I had made in 20, 2021 before reverting to Catholicism. And so I'm using some of the same arguments that I used as a Protestant to argue that she was not a perpetual virgin and that she had brothers and sisters. So here's the arguments. So this is from what a Protestant would say. <laughs> this is the funny part. Okay, so Luke 1, 7. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them at the end. The word firstborn son, that kind of got me. But then I found other passages with firstborn son. So like Zechariah 12, 10 says, and I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. Jesus is the firstborn indeed, but the firstborn over all creation, according to Paul in Colossians 
Matthew 1, 24 to 25 says, When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Now, the word for until there, heos, H-E-O-S, doesn't necessarily imply a change in condition. For example, there's many times in the Bible where Jesus uses the same word, and it didn't mean that something changed afterward. So, for example, when Jesus says, He'll be with us until the end of the age. It doesn't mean that after the end of the age, he's no longer going to be with us. He's always going to be with us. He'll eternally be with us. Matthew 13, 55 says, Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And are not his brothers, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? The Greek word for brothers could have been used, uh, or was used, eldelphoi, but they could have used this word, zadorphia, another Greek word for cousins. So what is going on? Well, we just have to look at the alternative use of the word brothers, kind of like we have brothers and sisters in Christ, sort of the same idea. But even calling other relatives was very common in the Hebrew language. St. Jerome believed Mother Mary took a lifelong vow of virginity. He argued in the perpetual virginity of Blessed Mary against Helvidius that the Greek word Adelphios, which was used to reference Jesus' brothers, could be applied to cousins as well. Many saints, including Ignatius, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Ambrose, and the Catholic Church all support this position. The other Mary in Matthew 27, 56 was noted to be the mother of James and Joseph. And there's a relationship there because she was of Clopas, and Clopas could have been the brother of Joseph, which is why there could have this been this relationship. There's also an ancient belief in what they call the three Marys, but I won't get into that right now. So in Acts, we have the, the Baptists, the beliefs that many people hold is that there's three James in the Bible, three significant James in the New Testament. But actually there's two because James, the apostle, who was also the brother of Jesus. Now, how do we know that? Here's one little piece of evidence that we can see that after James, the son of Zebedee, was martyred in Acts 12, the other apostle James in Acts 15 no longer is presented with a qualifier. Notice that no longer just mentions him as James. A qualifier would be, for example, James of Je Zebedee to separate him out from the other James. But since there wasn't another James, we don't bother with that in Acts 15. Also, we see the connection between James, the Lord's brother, and James, the other apostle. Because, uh, Paul says this in Galatians 1.19. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Okay, so this relative of Jesus. All right. This James, he also has been known as James the Just and James the Lesser. According to Josephus, he was martyred and estimates are somewhere between 62 or 69, again, by the emperor Nero. So he was martyred. And notice that his martyrdom is also not mentioned in the book of Acts. So in the book of Acts, we have Luke writing it and it's sort of abruptly cut off. We don't have him mention the martyrdom of Peter and of Paul or of James. Okay, which is pretty important and hints to the book of Acts and all of the synoptics being written early, earlier than 62, possibly. Now, Helvidius takes the Protestant position. He was a heretic. He was claimed as a heretic. And around 383, he took that position and he used the same arguments that Protestants use, that there's these mentions of brothers and sisters in the Bible. Now, here is the verse that I think Mike Winger might want to pay attention to. Revelation 11, 19, at the very end of the chapter 11, it says this, Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake and heavy hail. Next passage, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. This is an evidence for the assumption of Mary into heaven. 
Also, take note here, some very important things. We have an individual, um, a woman. We have an individual child, the ruler of the world with a rod of iron. Of course, that draws our attention right to Jesus. And who gave birth to Jesus? Well, Mother Mary. So this is a reference to her. Now, notice that she was crowned. Jesus crowned her. And some people have said that this represents Israel. Sure, it can also represent Israel. Some have said it represents a constellation. Sure, it can also represent a constellation. But it's definitely Mother Mary. And it's very interesting that the passage about her follows the Ark of the Covenant, directly follows it. We didn't create these chapters. And whoever created the chapters didn't, much, didn't make that relationship, potentially. According to Brant Petrie, in ancient times, queen mothers were often given prominence. For example, when Solomon took over the throne from David, David's wife Bathsheba stayed on as Solomon's queen mother. Queen mothers, or Gebira, appeared in King David's line. Kings such as Solomon had many wives, but only one mother, so the queen mother had a special role. Petrie also drew parallels between Mary and the childbearing woman wearing a crown in Revelation. Only queens and kings wear crowns in ancient times. So let's Switch over to some miracles attributed to Mary. When I was a Protestant, I made this video and I had these miracles in it. I never, I never uh, did not revere Mary. I always have given great reverence to Mary and I've always believed in these as miracles. So here's one, the Lady of Guadalupe. And in response to perhaps the Protestant Reformation that started around October 31st of 1517 under Martin Luther, uh, when Europe was starting to be converted to Protestantism, we had people like we had people like Calvin and, and Zwingli and some other people. We also had the break off of the Church of England from the Catholic Church. So we had a lot of stuff going on in this century. And so Mary turned her attention over to Mexico and she wanted to convert millions there. And so she wanted to open the eyes of the people who were over in the new land, in the new world. She wanted to open their eyes to her son, Jesus Christ. So here's what she did. On December 9, 1531, a woman appeared to St. Juan Diego in the form of an Aztec princess while he was on his way to Mass. In his native tongue of Nahuatl, she directed him to go to the archbishop and ask him to build a shrine on Tepeyac Hill. It became clear that she was Mother Mary. She also said, I will demonstrate, I will exhibit. I will give all my love, my compassion, my help, and my protection to the people. I am your merciful mother, the merciful mother of all of you who live united in this land, and of all mankind, of all those who love me, of those who cry to me, of those who seek me, of those who have confidence in me. Here I will hear their weeping, their sorrow, and will remedy and alleviate all their multiple sufferings, necessities, and misfortunes. That's in McClary, 2011. So Juan Diego told Archbishop Juan de Zumaraga the story. The Archbishop said that he would not believe him without a sign. So he returned to Tepeyac, where Mother Mary had told him to return to the Archbishop with roses, which she directed him to pick, though they were growing out of season in Mexico at the time. He returned to the Archbishop with the roses wrapped in his cloak, or what's called a tilma, cactus threads. When he presented the roses to the archbishop, the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe was imprinted on his peasant cloak. News of the miracle rapidly spread throughout Mexico. And within just a few years, nine million people, nine million people started following Our Lady of Guadalupe and converted to Christianity. Thank you, Our Lady of Guadalupe. Almost 600 years later, the cloak is still preserved and its miraculous qualities include the following, according to Sewell 2014. The tilma was made of a very poor quality, rough, mainly cactus fibers, yet the surface bearing the image is silky to the touch. Using infrared photography, experts determined there were no brush strokes, as if the image had appeared all at once. Dr. Philip Callahan, a biophysicist at the University of Florida, stated, such a technique would be impossible accomplishment in human hands. It often occurs in nature, however, in the coloring of bird feathers and butter butterfly scales and on the elytra of brightly covered beetles. By slowly backing away from the painting to a distance where the pigment and the surface sculpturing blend together, the overwhelming beauty of the olive-covered olive -covered, <laughs> olive -colored Madonna emerges as if by magic. Furthermore, experts have determined the image had no animal or mineral elements. Synthetic coloring did not exist in 15, 1531. In 2009, Dr. Adelfo 
Orozco, a researcher and physicist at the National University of Mexico, noted that, quote, the original tilma was exposed for approximately 116 years without any kind of protection, receiving all the infrared and ultraviolet radiation from the tens of thousands of candles near it and exposed to the humid and salty air around the temple. Yet it has never failed, faded. When Dr. Philip Callahan was working with the Tillman in 1979, he was stunned to find that the temperature of the Tilma held constant at 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, which is the same as a living person. A Mexican gynecologist called Dr. Carlos Fernandez de Castillo examined the Tilma. He noticed a flower with four petals over what was Mary's womb. The flower, known to the Aztecs as the Nahui Alan, is a symbol of the sun and plentitude. Dr. Castillo determined that the dimensions of Our Lady's body in the image were consistent with that of an expectant mother with a very close due date. Recall the original date of December 9th, her due date. <laughs> very close. We celebrate Christmas on December 25th. Peruvian ophthalmologist Dr. Jose Alte Tonsman examined the eyes on the image at 2,500 times magnification. The images of 13 people were in both eyes at different proportions, just as a human eye would reflect images of people. It appeared to be a snapshot of the moment Juan Diego unfurled his tilma before the archbishop. Furthermore, the image appears to be indestructible. In 1785, a worker who was cleaning the encasement of the image accidentally spilled a solution of 50% nitric acid solvent on a large portion of the image. The image and the tilma should have been eaten away, but they were unscathed. In 1921, an anti-clerical activist planted a bomb with 29 sticks of dynamite, dynamite in a pot of roses near to the tilma. When the bomb exploded, the blast was so intense that windows 150, way, 150 feet away blew out and a hefty brass crucifix twisted and bent back. Yet the tilma remained unscathed. Here's an image of... The crucifix on the right, and you can see the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe. Beautiful. Our Lady of Lourdes. In 1858, in the grotto of Massabile near Lourdes, France, Mother Mary appeared 18 times to a 14-year-old peasant girl named Bernadette Subaru. She referred to herself as the Immaculate Conception, and she said, pray and do penance for the conversion of the world. The Catholic Church investigated the claims for years before building a shrine at Lourdes, where thousands of cures have since occurred. 67 of these cures have been deemed miraculous. Actually, when I, I did this, I said I did this in 2021. Right now, we're at 70 cures that have been deemed miraculous. And so you could go find some of these at miraclehunter.com backslash Marian underscore apparitions backslash approved. Okay, so you always want to look at the approved apparitions. What's interesting about Our Lady of Lourdes one of the interesting things about it, and here you can see right here in the grotto, is that she said, I'm the Immaculate Conception. And that had always been a doctrine, but it hadn't been declared a dogma um, until very recently before that. In 1854, the Pope declared it a dogma, meaning that it is, it is an article that we have to believe as Catholics. It's very important. And he did that because there was a Protestant pushback saying that it was not something that people needed to believe. People had, had taken up the Helvidian position. And so you can just see right there. The other very interesting thing about this are the miracles that occurred right away and through the centuries. So it's pretty neat stuff. What did Martin Luther say about Mary's perpetual virginity? Well, here's what he said in that Jesus Christ was born a Jew. In 1523, he said, for this reason too, scripture does not quibble or speak about the virginity of Mary after the birth of Jesus, a matter about which the hypocrites are greatly concerned, as if it were something of the utmost importance on which our whole salvation depended. Actually, we should be satisfied simply to hold that she remained a virgin after the birth of Christ because scripture does not state or indicate that she later lost her virginity. Now, what did he say about the Immaculate Conception? He believed that too. On the day of the conception of the Mother of God in 1527, he said, it is sweet and pious belief that the infusion of Mary's soul was effected without original sin, so that in the very infusion of her soul, she was also purified from original sin and adorned with God's gifts, receiving a pure soul infused by God. Thus, from the first moment she began to live, she was free from all sin. And then it says in that Jesus Christ was born a Jew, 
we certainly need not to be so terribly afraid that someone will demonstrate out of his own head, apart from scripture, that she did not remain a virgin. But the scripture stops with that, that she was a virgin before and at the birth of Christ. For up to this point, God had need of her virginity in order to give us the promised blessed seed without sin. Of course, that refers to Isaiah 7.14. But John Calvin, here's what he said in his commentary on Matthew, Mark, and Luke. This is where I think some of the Protestants started believing that Mary was not a perpetual virginity. Here's what he says. The conjecture, which some have drawn from these words, that she had formed a vow of perpetual virginity is unfounded and altogether absurd. She would in that case have committed treachery by allowing herself to be united to a husband and would have poured contempt on the holy covenant of marriage, which could not have been done without mockery of God. Although the papists have exercised barbarous tyranny on this subject, yet they have never proceeded so far as to allow the wife to form a vow of continence at her own pleasure. Besides, it is an idle and unfounded supposition that a monastic life existed among the Jews. That's just completely false and sad. And here's Mary's response to, uh, actually, no, first here is Jesus's response to Sister Lucia. Now, Sister Lucia was one of the three children of Fatima, who Jesus, um, who Mary appeared to starting in May 13th of 1917 and continuing all the way up to the miracle of the sun in October of 1917. Sister Lucia says, quote, as I was in the chapel with our Lord, part of the night of May 29th to 30th, 1930, and speaking to our Lord about questions four and five, I suddenly found myself more intimately possessed by the divine presence. And if I am not mistaken, here is what was revealed to me. Now, Jesus had called on us to pray, convince our, confess our sins, and receive the Eucharist on the first five Saturdays of consecutive months to make reparations for our sins. Here's what Jesus said to Sister Lucia. My daughter, the reason is simple. There are five kinds of offenses and blasphemies uttered against the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Blasphemies against the Immaculate Conception. Blasphemies against her perpetual virginity. Blasphemies against her divine maternity, while refusing at the same time to recognize her as mother of men. The blasphemies of those who publicly seek to place in the hearts of children indifference or scorn or even hatred towards this Immaculate Mother. The offenses of those who outrage her directly in her holy images. There, my daughter, is the reason why the Immaculate Heart of Mary asked me to request this small act of reparation, and in consideration of it, to move my mercy to forgive souls who have had the misfortune to offend her. As for you, seek unceasingly, through your prayers and sacrifices, to move my mercy with regard to these poor souls. Now here was Mary's response to John Calvin. Calvin had initiated, and many people followed him, the idea that we can't have pictures, um, even though people who, you know, they, they don't want to see graven images, they call it, which is actually nobody is worshiping a picture and nobody is worshiping the crucifix image itself. People are worshiping the person behind it, right? So, so you're worshiping Jesus on the crucifix, Jesus on the cross. You're not worshiping the actual physical piece of a cross or the, the, the body that's put on that. But what happened was he had directed a lot of people to destroy images. And so we'll see what happens here at Village of Saluva. One summer day in 1608, a number of children were tending their sheep in a field on the outskirts of the village of Saluva. This is in Lithuania. They were playing near a large rock, close to a wooded section of the field, shouting merrily to one another in carefree fun. Suddenly, one after another stood transfixed, staring in the direction of the rock. In the silence, there could be heard the sound of a loud sobbing. Then the children beheld a beautiful young woman standing on the rock, holding a baby in her arms and weeping bitterly. Her overwhelming grief was only too evident. She did not speak, but looked at them sadly as they stood, as she stood there, weeping as though her heart was breaking. So profuse were her tears that they ran down her cheeks and some of them splashed on the rock. The woman was dressed in flowing blue and white robes unlike any costume with which the children were familiar. Her long, light brown hair fell softly over her shoulders. A strange light surrounded both the woman and child. So startled were the children, they could not speak, but merely stood and stared. Amazement soon turned to fright when the woman with her baby disappeared as mysteriously as she had appeared. Then all began to talk excitedly about what they had seen. One of the boys ran to the village to tell the Calvinist pastor. He was told to stop making up such fantastic tale and to go back to the fields. 
When the children returned home in the evening, they told their parents and neighbors about the weeping woman. The news spread quickly through the little village, and the next morning, most of the townspeople had gathered around the rock. Some were scoffing loudly, but others were impressed by the children's tearful insistence that they were telling the truth. This was proven because whether the children were questioned separately or together, each told the same identical story, even to the smallest detail. Then the blessed virgin reappeared. The Calvinist pastor, aware of the crowd that had gathered, became alarmed at the gullibility of his people believing in this Roman superstition, as he had labeled the story. He warned them that this was the work of Satan, who wanted to lead them away. As the Calvinist pastor paused to catch his breath, a heart-rending sound of sobbing was heard. All eyes turned to the rock, and there, standing in her midst, was the weeping lady with the baby in her arms, just as the children had described her. The people stood in amazement. The pastor, too, could do nothing but stare. The woman's face was clouded in deep sorrow, and her cheeks were bathed in bitter tears. Finally, the pastor regained his composure and said, Why are you weeping? In a voice filled with sorrowful emotion, she replied, There was a time when my beloved son was worshipped by my people on this very spot. But now they have given the sacred soil over to the plowman and the tiller and to the animals for grazing. Without a word, she vanished. The belief that the mother of God had appeared in person to chide them for their neglect of the Catholic faith quickly grew among the people. Most of them heeded her message and began to return to the one true church founded by her divine son, Jesus Christ. So complete was this return that a decade later, on the Feast of the Nativity of the Blessed Virgin Mary, more than 11,000 people received Holy Communion during a Mass offered at the scene of the apparitions. Then a miracle occurred. Such was the miracle that the Mother of God brought in the village of Saluva, where there had been no church, no priest, no Mass for almost 80 years. The bishop appointed Father John Kavikovicius to investigate the phenomenon and question all the witnesses to the events. I'll just say Father John K. Here's what happened. This is where it gets good. A blind man regained his sight. In many apparitions of the Blessed Mother, there is usually a picture or a statue associated with the event. Our Lady of Saluva is not an exception. Now, this is from all of this that I'm saying to you on this story is from OurLadyOfSaluva.org. A blind man, more than 100 years old, lived in a nearby village. The stories of the apparitions reached him, and he recalled a night some 80 years before when he helped Father Holobka bury an iron-clad chest filled with church treasures besides a large rock. The villagers led him to the field of the apparitions to see if he could help locate the place where the treasures were buried. No sooner had he reached the spot than his sight was miraculously restored. Falling to his knees with joy and gratitude, he pointed to the exact spot where the chest had been buried. The ironclad chest was dug out of the ground, and when it was open, there, perfectly preserved, was a large painting of the Madonna and child, several gold chalices, vestments, church deeds, and other documents. The painting was enshrined permanently in the Basilica of the Birth of the Blessed Virgin Mary and is venerated to this day as a miraculous image of Saluva. Here's the image, and here's the church. Look at how beautiful it is. European churches are incredible. Another good reason to be a Catholic. <laughs> so in conclusion, Catholics revere Mother Mary and pray to her for her intercession, yet do not consider her a god. That is the ancient heresy of Claridiasm, which the church rejected. Some Protestants discount how special Mother Mary is to the birth, life, and ministry of Jesus, and that's a real shame. Thousands across the world have attested to her miracles and presence. She should be revered as the Blessed Virgin Mary, our Blessed Mother, the Mother of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I hope you enjoyed this video today. If you did, please like and subscribe and do come again. And just remember, whether you eat, drink, or whatever you do, do it all for God's glory. Thank you.